Hello everybody and welcome to Just Draw Just Paint part 14. This week we are going to look at an idea to go from something as ugly as this, the white page of death, into something as wonderful as this, a full painting, right? So in order for us to achieve this result, I want to walk you through how to beat that horrible, horrible sensation we all feel when we look at a blank page. So I'm going to break this down into the psychology, right? We're going to start with the explainer and then I'm going to move into what I like to call the circle, right? And then from there, we're going to move into the demo itself and show you how I move through the circle. Okay, so let's start with the explainer here. So why is the blank canvas so scary in the first place, right? We should know why something is the way it is before we figure out how to solve it, right? Makes complete sense. So. I like to call this the infinite abyss, right? It's you just staring at this blank page. It goes on forever and you don't know what to do with it, right? So what does that mean? I don't know what to do with it, right? So let's break that down. Number one, we feel uncertain, right? So that means that we have some kind of fear or failure. Number two, there's just too much possibility when we look at a blank canvas. So we tend to have what I like to call a lack of focus. Number three, we feel an immense amount of performance pressure, right? What if it sucks? What if what we paint or what we put down doesn't work and then we've ruined the whole thing, right? Especially true if you're working traditional, by the way, because then you, you have to like, oh, I have to wait for the new paint to dry or I throw that page away or whatever it might be, right? If you're working with ink or charcoal, it's very unforgiving. So this is even harder, I would say, the blank canvas, a literal blank canvas in real life than it is with digital, but still, right? Digital artists, we still feel performance pressure. Number four, is the purpose pressure, right? So what if what I'm making doesn't matter? And this comes from all kinds of angles. This comes from professional angles, like, you know, what if someone doesn't like it? What if I can't get hired on the work, etc., etc. It's a performance pressure. Number five is it's not rewarding enough. So doing the art brings me anxiety. So the reason this happens, and I'll explain it in the circle, is because we're, we're basically not getting the right rewards from producing the art. And I'll explain what you need to do and avoid in order for this to not be a thing. So let's move right into the circle. Okay, so the circle has an origin. Pardon me for the blank, black pages. For some reason, full screen on Photoshop does this. So here's our start, right? Which is you need to find yourself in a place of joy. And this goes right back to the explainer where we talk about something not being rewarding enough and bringing you anxiety when you, when you want to perform and produce art. I have suffered from this in the past a lot, and what I have discovered is that in order for me to not feel anxiety around producing artwork, I have to operate from a place of joy. That means that wherever I'm operating from, it cannot be diluted by nonsense, right? That means that if I'm feeling rewards from false things, whether it's sugar, caffeine, you know, name any vice on the planet, right? That is giving you false joy. Right? It's bringing you fake dopamine. So you're, you're flooding your brain with these chemicals and these chemicals are not allowing you to operate from a place of joy because art is a long journey, right? And the reward has to be along the way and then hopefully at the end you can experience completion joy, right? If you get to the end of a painting and you find the process not rewarding, it's probably because you're experiencing other things in your life that are more rewarding than art. Now, this could be a different vocation and that's totally fine, right? If you find yourself enjoying something else other than art, go do that other thing. Maybe that's what your purpose is, right? But if art actually brings you real joy, once you filter out all that other nonsense, then art is for you, right? The original place where we started drawing and painting, that place of joy is exactly where we need to start all of our journey, right? So if you can't get to this first step, the place of joy, you need to take a step back and kind of ask yourself, like, what am I doing in my life that's bringing me different kind of joy that might not be good for me, right? And then how do I replace that with production, right? producing things that bring me joy okay number two let's move on we take tiny bits of action right here okay into what i call a simple idea okay and this removes the endless possibilities so we've already started to remove one of the issues of a blank canvas by taking a small action towards a simple idea so this might be something as simple as gosh i don't know what to draw let me just browse pinterest or google or watch a video or a movie and something in there will spark an idea and you go, that's a cool idea, let me run with that. It could be something as stupid as a picture of a frog, right? Or an apple that inspires you to think of something a little bit differently and to at least have something to start with. Once you have that one thing, right? You've removed the endless other things that it could be, 
right? And in that way, you now know how to research and reference, which brings me to the next part, right? So once you've decided what you want, you need to aim to fail early. And this is the entire purpose of what production artists, what we do is we thumbnail everything out on purpose because we know that our first, say, 10 attempts or whatever it might be, are gonna suck. Maybe the first three are gonna suck, right? But everyone after that is gonna get a little bit better until we start to realize what this idea is, how it's coming together. And so we've moved from a simple idea where we remove endless possibilities and we've now moved into avoiding the fear of failure and performance by aiming to fail, right? If you just aim to fail, right? Just fail a million times, you're not aiming to win. You're not aiming to be amazing, right? You're actually aiming to suck first. Right? And when you suck first, you take the pressure off. Right, And we, we, we talked about performance pressure earlier. This is taking that pressure off. Right, So if we just move into a situation where we're just thumbnailing, sketching, having fun, again, coming to, at this from a place of joy, then suddenly the process itself becomes rewarding and we're not aiming to win too early. Right, And that is, by the way, one of the worst things is like you start here and you're like, I have to make something amazing and then you fail and you go into a depression, right? And then you get into the problem of the blank canvas kicking your ass. That's not what we want. We obviously want to fail early, so we avoid fear of failure and we can move into um, no lack of performance pressure, right? So number four, we move out of failing early into what I call revealing the intention. So the entire purpose of failing early is to uncover how this simple idea here is going to be taken forward into something that has purpose, or meaning, right? And you're gonna discover that in this process. In this process here, it's slowly going to reveal itself and you're gonna have an idea of an intention of where to take that image or that idea, right? And you'll see this in every single Just Draw video. I use this exact process to prevent myself from just staring blankly at a screen and not knowing what to produce, right? Instead of doing that, I'm actually producing stuff, right? Much, much better. Okay, so next one, we're moving into saying goodbye to anxiety. Right? Because at this point, the anxiety that you would have had in this area here is now disappearing through all of these processes. And so now you have your intention, you have your idea, you might have a thumbnail. Now is the point at which we lean into the fundamentals. Right, This is everything I teach at my school. Right, This is how we give structure to what we're doing so that we remove that anxiety. And finally, we move into the reward, Right, the real reward, the real dopamine reward of taking that image to a masterpiece finish. So that's about it. I think now it's the time for us to jump into the demo. So let's get started. All right, so here we are with my reference board and this is where I'm gonna get my simple idea from, right? So I was browsing around and I thought, hey, I haven't done a cowboy image yet, at least, you know, in any project that I've been busy with. Um, so I thought, you know, this could be a cool little thing to do here. So first off, we're gonna aim to fail, right? We're gonna start our thumbnailing process. And all I'm after here is something that could be readable. You can see I'm leaning into my reference shapes. I've got a basic idea in my head. I know it's going to be a showdown, right, between some characters. And so now I'm just setting up what that might look like. What kind of staging could I do for this kind of story? And so if one of these fails, I don't care, right? It doesn't really matter. I'm just playing around with basic compositions, dropping some characters in. The detail doesn't matter. All that matters is that the image flows, right? And then I have a decent idea. And from there, I can take it forward, right? Pretty simple stuff. Playing around with a little bit of perspective, moving stuff around. There are no rules, right? The rules are find something, right? That's our only objective at this point is we're aiming to fail quickly, right? Find the worst decisions, eliminate those and keep the good ones. And those good decisions will then reveal the intent for the image, right? We'll know where to take it. But unless we go through this process here, which is aiming to fail through rep repeating new compositions and new ideas, there's no way that we'll be able to get to a place comfortably without overstressing ourselves, right? And we want to remove all of that kind of stuff. So even these poses of the characters that I have in the image, all from reference, right? Not really using my brain at all. All I'm looking for is how can I set up an image that reads in space, depth, and camera angle, right? That's what I'm looking for. I want something cinematic or something that tells some kind of story. So in the end, I actually end up borrowing a couple ideas from a couple thumbnails. I don't stick with just one. And that's pretty common to my process. Sometimes I see something I like in one thumbnail and I want to take it into another. And really, these sketches here, totally for me, right? It's all I care about. What I want is just one character to be facing off with another. And the one that is um, holding their ground, you know, essentially locking off a section of the, um, you know, travels of this, this, this protagonist, 
they're going to have a posse with them, right? Some kind of evil posse. Now, this second image here that I'm drawing up, it kind of reminds me of the classic setup of Westerns, you know, the showdown where, you know, meet at high noon and have a have a shoot off, you know, like that kind of thing for me is um, kind of tropey, right? Which is why I didn't go with it. I kind of felt like we've seen so many of those things. And it, it, it look, granted, that's kind of what Westerns are about, right? Is leaning into the trope. But to be fair, like, it's so much better if we could just tell a different story, right, from a different angle. Like, even this image here, right, this could have been a completely different um, composition that I went for, which is one way pulled back where we have a situation, but it's not intimate enough, right? We're not close enough to the character to really feel something, even though we're actually selling the background here, right? So that might have been a better composition for selling the background, like a village with some kind of water tower leading up into the mountains, some kind of location that could have worked. Even a story moment, it could have maybe worked, but we would have maybe had to rework that angle and see if we could kind of get all of it into one image if possible. Now this one at the bottom, I do like the flow of the painting and kind of where people are positioned and what they're doing, like some people around a campfire and stuff, but it felt a little too idle to me and I wasn't quite sure where I would put a protagonist, you know, if they were to be in this image. So at the end of the day, I actually decided to opt for a mix, a blend between the first one and the second one. And in that way, um, it makes sense, right? Now you can actually almost imagine the final composition that I showed at the beginning of the video, what that's going to look like, right? So here, just playing into a few rock shapes, ideas, you know, balancing the image, seeing if, if something can, can work, even with scale, right? Scale is incredibly important because with a story moment, you want to have your characters nice and close, at least readable. So here I'm just taking an image I really like the colors of, blurring it out, and using that as a base. And actually later on, even though I have a base in here for my atmospheric perspective and colors, I actually eliminate most of it because I end up going with a slightly different palette that I felt more, um, that actually arrived through more of an accident, right? But now is the stage that we're starting to reveal the intent, right? So we have a basic composition, we've combined some elements, now we need to paint into this. And again, we're, we're not looking 100% here to fail. We're now moving into the intent of the painting, which is we have a composition. Let's get a first read on that composition by blocking in all of our values, all of our shapes and our basic um, layering, right? We're looking for what's in front of what else, you know, what is the perspective? How are we showing the perspective? All the, you know, typical fundamentals, tricks of the trade that we use to tell stories through images and control it, right, is what I'm kind of slowly applying here. So I'm just dabbing paint everywhere and I'm being quite um, messy, right? I'm just trying to get my shapes in and I'm not fussed about things like textures or 100% with the colors. All I'm after here is just the structure. Does the structure work? Does the flow work? If that's true, then we can move into more detail. So my intention is quite clear here, right? We've got the main character in the foreground who I'm gonna block out, and I've got this other character that's just in front of him with his posse behind. And the character who's just in front of him has to be the leader, right, of the of the, the evil guys, right? We have to make sure that he looks like he's about to set off on this new guy. So I really like this composition because it's a pass into the mountains and it's clearly landlocked by all these rocks and mountains. And so there is only one way up that path. And so by the posse blocking off this uh, section in the image, it's clear from a geological point of view that the character cannot pass this area. So we've already created believability through the composition, right? We don't need to tell too much of a story. Even at this level of read, we understand what the story is. We understand where the character is going. And for me, whenever I'm put onto a, a conceptual project for a video game, animation, movie, whatever it might be, if, if I'm concepting on that project, I, I really take my time to make sure that I'm telling the story first because I, I always feel that's what matters, right? It's the thing we walk away from, the experience, and we remember that moment in the game or the moment in the, the series where there was that conflict, right? You want to have the, these moments be memorable. And the best way to do that for me is to tie story in, right? So here I'm just doing a little bit of hand rendering just to kind of show like, hey, if you want to take this into the realm of just painting absolutely everything, you can, right? So by dotting some detail here and there, I'm getting a sense and I'm pushing the intent of the feeling of the painting forward, right? So I'm just adding just enough of this detail as I get in here to start the process of what I want things to look like. 
And I'm also working into the foreground elements a little bit more by hand because I know that those elements are going to have to be the most detailed because they're closer to camera. I also really like this idea that there's this natural or perhaps half man-made staircase on the rocks on the left-hand side. It's a really nice way to um, not only elevate the characters, but also, uh, you know, elevate the environment in terms of the mood because it shows that this environment is explorable, that there are people who can go up onto that hill, create an encampment, go over the hill onto another path. You know, maybe there's multiple ways in the video game to approach this area, but all of them will lead to this kind of encounter with these characters, which is, by the way, I, I've decided to call this piece the encounter because that's what it's all about, right? It's all about how do we, um, you know, show the conflict between two parties. And that's all in the contrast of the image, right? We have the foreground character who's kind of stuck. Then we have this expanse before him. So he has to make a decision. Is he going to maybe pay a toll? Is he going to bribe them? Uh, you know, like whatever it might be, or, or have a shootout, you know, it, it's all down to the feeling of something's about to go down, right? And you, maybe the player, or you, maybe the audience who's watching the show, have to kind of engage with that feeling, right? And so you can get into the psychology of these things, you can create little ways of showing that off. But right now, we've finished out this painting, and we're about ready to jump into the uh, slightly a few more details here. I'm just kind of rendering out a few more things. And then what I'd like to do is just um, talk about the finishing of this image, right? So I'm going to paint into this foreground element here, which are some rocks. Just defining a little bit more form in the foreground and the midground. Once we have that, we have enough to go on, right? Our intention right now is very set. We're kind of happy with the placement of the characters. We're happy with the environment. We're happy with the flow of the image. And pretty soon we'll be able to work into this, um, you know, using a, a little bit of photo textures in order to establish um, basic texture. And then we'll be able to set up the characters and kind of take it from there. Now I'm using just a tiny bit of atmospherics to separate the elements. Right, a little bit of value here, a little bit of value there. Always making sure that my objects in the foreground are a little bit more contrast, a little bit more saturated than everything behind it. Right now the entire image is actually still quite flat. We're going to have to do a couple light passes to bring this out. But the background is starting to read quite nicely. We've got some good shapes back there. And we're starting to build up texture in the foreground to elevate its complexity. And pretty soon, we'll be able to, yeah, separate more and more elements, you know, playing with the perspective here, pushing it. And so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you wanted to do something as intense as paint every single element in the, in the image, Sure, go ahead, right? As I always say in my demos, you can spend as much time as you want on your art. For me personally, I'm always under various deadlines, so I have to kind of pick my battles. And, uh, you know, this would have been such a fun project to just paint everything. But sometimes just adding a little bit of that photo texture allows me to paint faster, right? So I do end up painting most details. In fact, I paint out a lot of detail, but um, it's a lot faster for me to develop a painting with more techniques than it is with less, right? Kind of uh, comes with the whole territory of playing around with this stuff so we're about done here with the values uh, we're kind of just getting in here and just separating every single element here we don't want to overdo it because this is not obviously a misty um, terrain right it's a dusty terrain right we can lean into that but we can't make this place overly cloudy or overly value um, um, controlled right we have to be careful with how much we use as always we call this seasoning right how much you season your piece in various ways I really like that phrase because it. I always find art and cooking to be so similar. Um, I actually studied cooking in my early, uh, early days, right? And I find the two industries very, very similar in terms of how you approach big ideas and you work them in, and then you put all your detail at the end, and it's very, very similar. So, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe I like to think you know a lot of artists are really good cooks, right? Uh, that's that's kind of true from what I've seen, but maybe I'm crazy, right? Maybe that's just my own experience, but yeah. That's it for now. Uh, I think I'm rambling a bit, so let's jump into the next part here. I'll just finish up on a few of these details.
All right, and there we have it. Okay, so now we've stopped, we have arrived at this spot in our composition. And what I want to do is run you through every single decision I've made to take this from this point here to the exact final that we had in our thumbnail, right? So we've removed all the thinking early on because we know this is the setup, right? We've got our shapes in place, we've got our basics in place, and we've even started to, at this early, early stage, paint into our painting and get some details, right? So you've seen me do a little bit of that to get a sense of where things are. But as it is now, the painting is definitely not finished, right? It needs a lot of work. So what we're gonna do as we move forward is refine absolutely everything. I'll talk you through all the decision-making I do, and you'll see a pretty awesome refinement come together, okay? So one note here is that today's uh, demo is not really about the painting process. We've covered that in the past, and we've kind of gone through the techniques. What I'd like to do today is just talk about, you know, the, the rush forward from this point to prove that a blank canvas is nothing to be scared of, right? As long as you have good fundamentals, you've been training that, and you have a setup, right, where you, you're happy with something like this and you have your notes, right? It's time. It's time to then paint into this because your instinct at that point as a, as a well-seasoned artist, right, someone who's, who's put in the work with their, you know, as I said earlier, fundamentals, it's now easier to take it forward. So let's just jump through here and show you all the decision-making I've made, right? So Starting with um, this one here, I want to turn this on now. Don't be shocked, it's quite a jump, right? You can see from there to there, right? It seems like a lot, but you can see the basic structure of the painting hasn't really changed, right? It's still the same thumbnail we had before. The only difference, of course, is that we've added all the awesomeness into this, right? We've decided to save time, as I usually do with my paintings, um, by utilizing photo texture and then painting out those details and controlling them in a sensible way in order to populate the entire scene with something that we can take forward, right? So some really, really awesome happy accidents happened here, uh, which I wanna walk you through, which happens, right? When along the way, you happen to do these kind of cool things. So first thing, I just add a little rock there. I actually changed my mind later about that. But you can see here, I'm starting to play with values, right? If you see that, I'm pushing my values back and I'm starting to add a little bit of photo texture detail into each element. Now you can see, I'm not a purist when it comes to even photos, right? Like people are not purists when they add photos, right? They want to paint everything. I'm not in that school. And I'm also not in the school of every photo has to be absolutely perfect. In fact, if a photo just gives me the right colors and the right idea and the right kind of lighting, I will stick with that. And I may even use that, for example, in here and here. I like these colors so much, the way they blend with my background, that I decide to take those colors forward into the rest of the painting. So here we're just adding more detail into our rock shapes, right? To add just a little bit of that extra texture, painting over that. And you can see I'm already starting to paint into the background here. And what's happening, I want you to notice over here is a beautiful color sequence that's starting to happen on the path. I want to take that into the foreground. Here, just painting into the mid ground and developing that because this whole area, big jump here, need a lot of painting. So there's a photo texture here, but I've masked out the parts I want to show, right? And I'm starting to paint into that to reveal, right? So here I'm just adding more and more texture into the background. You can see into the right-hand side of the painting. Wasn't really happy with that rock. So again, not a purist. I don't care how long I spend painting that rock. I will drop something over it to fix it, right? So that really is how I work, right? I really just build up the painting here. I'm finishing a shape that we didn't have before, right? So making small decisions as I go to the composition, adding more texture in, uh, giving it a sense of lighting, right? Because I know my light is coming from the top left here. Later on, I'll refine exactly what that has to do um, because we haven't dropped any strong lighting in here other than this mid plane and this section here being in shadow. So now I'm just starting to add all texture to the background elements, right? I want a nice feeling that these are desert rocks, desert mountains. So I go ahead and look for that kind of reference. And once I'm happy with that, I'll stick with it, right? And I'll start painting out those details here, just bringing the path back here, these beautiful colors into the foreground and changing the palette that I had before into something a little bit more neutral a little bit less saturated, right? Looking really, really nice. And now I can just start adding photo texture, right? To just enrich the foreground. Because after all, every image, the number one place that all of our focus is, is in the foreground, right? So I want all of that detail there. I'm going to start adding into the rock shape here because I wasn't happy with that. 
and I'm going to start painting into the ground here to get some texture, right? In fact, even that one there is kind of pointless. We could get rid of it. Um, here, just adding some contrast because we have to match the contrast of the foreground, right? Very important. You can see I just painted that in. So again, by not being a purist, it allows me to jump in and add, for example, here, paint strokes, right? To get a feeling of rock on top of what I already have as a base, right? And it allows me to have the flexibility of controlling how painterly my painting is going to go versus how realistic, right? And so now I'll start moving it more towards painterly, right? And I'll start taking away from the absolute um, insanity of just too much detail, right? You always want to have a good control of your pixel density. For example, if you look back here in the photos, every little piece in here, right? It's way too dense with detail here in the foreground, very, very loose, right? So we need to start matching these things. It doesn't have to be perfect but it needs to read, right? It needs to be like, oh, that's, there's a big shape there. I can read it. So now we're going to go into the second part that I did and the next pass of painting. I usually, by the way, label my groups as P1, P2, all that kind of stuff. Even this one here, the new texture, you can see was such a massive change to the painting. It almost transformed the entire thing entirely, right? That is probably the biggest change. And in line with the Pareto principle, when it comes to working on your work, is that most of the big changes happen early on in your process, for example, Everything in our process was handled early on through our thumbnail, right? Look at that. The shapes haven't changed at all. They've just moved a little bit, but everything else, our intention is still there. And that's really what it takes to remove that guessing part of the game out of the equation. So now we're going to come back in here, recognizing that our texture had a huge impact, right? It changed the palette. It changed the composition. It gave us some more information. And now's the time we start getting in here and refining all of these details. So I'm going to start by painting over the background, the foreground, and look at that pass, right? You can see I'm removing detail where detail doesn't need to be, and I'm painting in my intention, right? So for example, in here, right, we had the photo making a few mistakes for us, which is it introduced light from an angle I didn't want it. I want the light to come towards us a little bit. So in that way, I can't have light there. I must paint it out, right? Refining my shapes. Even getting rid of shapes that weren't useful before, like too many shapes or shapes I didn't like, I'm going to paint those out, right? Boom, gone, right? That's exactly how I like to do it. And here is the time we're going to start introducing the lighting, right? So I want the lighting in the foreground to kind of lay the foundation for everything else. So we know the light is coming from the left. So I'm putting this nice big shadow for this rock piece here. And now I'm going to start building up where the light is actually hitting, right? It's hitting up there. It's hitting on top of those rocks up there, defining their silhouette out of the shape, right? Because without that, it's kind of flat, right? With that, adds dimension, right? And it's very, very simple, just a few brush strokes. And in here, you can see I'm just adding more and more lighting. In fact, I'm adding quite a bit of ambient lighting from the sky. You can see some of these blues and purples mixing into my shadow zones of the faces that are facing up towards the sky, right? Fundamentals, right? Fundamentals. So adding that in there, and now we get into the nitty gritty of refinement, right? So now is the point at which we're gonna start refining stuff. So we are getting in here, we're adding streams of light. And all of this, by the way, is in context of the characters that I'm constantly turning off and on again. But I want to treat those a little bit separately and come back to those since I, I, I want to show you how much development has gone into them. So now we can uh, take a look at this, right? We've introduced a little bit more light there. Some plants around, right? Just random photos or I've painted them out or I've introduced uh, my own uh, paintbrush work here. You know, just building up each layer, introducing piece by piece as I go here. Just a little shrubbery, little believability into the, to the section here. I want this light streak here to I'll, I'll explain exactly why later but it's but essentially it's very very important for the character story right so here just introducing some more uh darkening the foreground a little bit there adding some cleanup to the background right so every now and then i have to go back in and clean up the mess that i've made right so there we go i've clarified the fact that the road continues up the mountain that that's our ultimate destination on this quest right but we're going to have a conflict over here so now I'm going to add in just a bit of light streaks here to bring out some of the character stuff. And here I'm adding a sky in, right? To just add some more dynamism. Add, now we're going to turn on the characters. I've done quite a lot of work on the characters. In fact, I would say the most work has been done on the characters. You can see now they're lining up really, really nicely with our original intention. And if I walk you through that, my goodness, there is so much going on here. In fact, I have to delete a couple layers that aren't even being used. So let's just jump in here and take a look, right? At how rough this really is. So if I turn this on here, that's just a background that I'm just using that to uh, create shadows, right? So all my shadows typically lie underneath everything else. So I had this character in there because I was matching it to the original thumbnail, right? Because this thumbnail had a cool guy 
standing in the way of the path and I really like that. So I got him in there and I started adding some bounce light from the ground up into the horse, right? Really, really beautiful. Uh, just controlling it a little bit here, too light, right? I didn't want it to be so yellow. So I added some white into the highlights. And this is really where the skill comes in, right? Just adding characters in, uh, controlling their lighting and their, their contrast relative to distance, right? So here's his shadow. Is the next character shadow, which is actually him, right? So here's the, the main character staring off our hero, right? I dropped him in, but he's definitely not good enough at the moment. His face isn't recognizable. His lighting's all over the place. And I didn't really like the face. In fact, it had a reverse lighting, which I wasn't a fan of, right? I obviously want the light to come from the left-hand side, not the right. So here we have a rider in the back, again, matching our thumbnail, right? We haven't changed any decisions, right? All of our decisions were made early on, and now we're sticking with it. So here, just adding some lighting on him, right, where the light can peek over and kind of hit him and light up a little bit of the background. That's what's happening over there. Here, we just added another stooge, another NPC, right? Added another one over here. This guy looks like he could be, um, you know, hired from south of the border. And here we have a little bit of lighting on him, right, because he's standing in that warm light. He can be hit by it. In fact, by the way, if I don't like the color of that lighting, which I currently don't, I can just change that, right? I can come back in here. Just add a little bit of uh, yellow instead, right? And that's fine. I might keep it a bit warm, but that is totally fine by me, right? Now we introduce the original barrier, right? Which is almost like a doorway. It's a little bit of a, a pass, right? Where people kind of control what's going on here. It doesn't have to make sense, right? It just has to be something that flows with the painting at this stage, right? We're not going for high-end exact compositional concept here, right? So very, very Wild West. Got a little bit of bullhorns up there, all that kind of good stuff. Here, I got the hero, right? So the hero is broken down massively because when he first arrived, he was very, very underdeveloped. So let me just get rid of the stuff I'm not using here and show you what's up, right? So here, all of this is the base of the hero. In fact, I should give him a new color so we can see him. So he's orange, right? So here's our base, right? Let's actually uh, bring out the base here and um, hide that, right? So a lot of preliminary painting was done over this character. There was actually a base underneath this, which um, was not very refined, right? It was it was kit bashed from a bunch of photos and from a little bit of 3D and some uh, reference that I found, right? So I started painting into this. You can see parts are painted, parts a little bit photo. This is all painted right here, a little bit of photo just to get the accuracy of underneath the chin. This is all, but it's all been relatively painted out, right? So it's not hyper realistic. It's getting there but it's not quite there but we can get away with it because it's so close to camera right that it has to read with detail so that's my chief aim here then i can add just a little bit of lighting right to make sure the light is coming from the top left side and contrast the character in the foreground with darker values so it reads on the background and now i'm going to start adding in just a bit of that contrast to the lighting right really punching him out in the frame since he's the main character and I'm going to add a new hat because this hat was cool, but it was a bit lame. So I found a really cool hat and I painted into it to get exactly the right kind of shapes I wanted. And as I progress here, it seems like small iterations, but these are just little paint marks, right, to clean up. Here I added the lighting on the hat. These are small things, right, but they add up to the believability of the image because everything needs to be grounded in the rules of the painting, right? If there's light coming from a certain direction, I need to be loyal to that light. So even the hat here was too flat from the reference. I had to add light in, right? So it's this kind of attention to detail that you don't see in aspiring work, right? When artists first start using things like photos and stuff like that, they get sucked in and they just leave it, right? They don't touch it, they don't add anything to it, and they don't really control it. And it's really important that you do do that, especially if you want an overall result, right? So here we're just going to add a little bit of that bounce contrast, right? Just improving that contrast on the character there. Um, here, just adding into the main, just making it look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. Adding a little bit more there. In fact, we could even rein that back. I might even rein it back just a little bit here. Almost 50%. You know, you can kind of decide where you want to stop. Maybe maybe a little bit less than that. That could be fine, you know. But yeah, maybe we keep it on. Who knows, right? Um, just a little bit of visual detail in here with the muscles, right? I'm starting to add just a little bit of paint work into the harness because I need him to be holding the reins, right? So I paint in the reins. Right, and so flexible, what you're able to do, as long as you know what you want to do in the painting, very, very simple, right? Very, very simple, nothing has changed. Uh, I left out a character back here because he's above this character, right? So there he is, he's sitting at the back, or standing, I should say. 
Here, adding light to the characters, right? Grounding them in the environment, allowing them to look like the sun is touching the tips of their hats and, and shoulders in this position. Uh, adjusting the face of the guy at the back, right? Just a little bit of change to the angle, changing of light. You can see quite a lot of painting on this guy with the horse because I needed to make it look convincing that he's coming down the hill, right? Otherwise, he looks a little bit derpy. Um, then I add just a new face to this guy down here in the foreground, right? To allow him to sit in contrast. And here you can see I'm adding a lot of light into these characters so that they can contrast, right, with their faces, so we can care about their faces. Here, adding just a little bit of lighting to the guy in the foreground, put, put, basically allowing him to be um, popped out, right, a little bit more. And that's about it. Now, last final thing in the painting, right, is to add just a little bit of post effect. You can see here just to add a little bit of contrast to this area over here and a little bit of contrast over here on the character. And that is essentially the full painting, right? So you can see quite a jump, right? From this stage here where we stopped painting, right? Into adding those details, into adding those environments, right? Cleaning up. This is the entire pro process of cleaning up and adding. Again, cleaning up and adding of effects, right? But you can see how the characters were the main driving force for me to decide on that lighting. Because once I have this light streak in here, it acts as a psychological barrier between this person and this person, right? Saying that this here is a place you have to cross, right? And that kind of psychology is something I really, really enjoy putting in my paintings if I can. I try to find ways to smuggle in little things like that. So that's the entire process, guys. I hope you liked it. The last thing we can do here is obviously just um, remember to add a border to your work or take it out, whatever you prefer. And I just added a silly title called The Encounter. So. I hope you like the process, guys. I'm going to full screen this here. And uh, that'll be it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the process. I hope that you've enjoyed seeing how to go from a simple idea to get yourself out of the, you know, um, the mangroves of indecision, right? Into knowing how to start a painting and how to finish a painting. Now, granted, there is a little bit of work you have to do on your fundamentals. You do have to practice your painting. All of those things are important, and I recommend you spend time with them as homework. But certainly, the most important thing is that loop, right? That circle of moving through your, your ideation so that you can get out the grossness of your painting and move into a place where you're confident to finish something, right? And that's huge because if we look at our original intention here, right? Look at that, right? It's so different. It's so flat. It's so boring. And yet, it had so much information for us to then take to a complete finish, right? And that's really the key here. So I hope you learned something this week. I hope you had fun. I hope I managed to help you break out of this vicious cycle of not being able to start something. And I certainly look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks. Have a nice day.